Through his public TV programs and his books, Carl Sagan has explained difficult concepts about science and astronomy to millions of Americans. In his new book, The Demon-Haunted World, Science as a Candle in the Dark, he applies scientific thinking to debunk beliefs that come out of pseudoscience and superstition. He uses what he describes as his baloney detection kit to challenge beliefs in channeling, alien abduction, and more. Carl Sagan, what sign are you? Just kidding. Um, <laughs> I know astrology is, is, is one of your pet peeves. <laughs> well, if it, if it worked, it would be great, but it doesn't work. So what, what do you say when people uh, inadvertently, uh, unknowingly ask you what sign you are? I say, um, oh, I don't know, slow, soft shoulders or... Um, uh, I, I guess that's as inadequate a joke here as it is in pa- parties. I try. <laughs> I, try I, I, I try to uh, uh, explain why this is not a very smart question. And why uh, isn't it? Because it doesn't matter. You've learned absolutely nothing about me to find out that I'm a, a, a Taurus or a Gemini or whatever it is, because it, there's no correlation between when you're born and what your character is like. What's more, how does it work? I was, I'm born in a closed room in a hospital. The light from, let's say, Mars doesn't get to me. What f- aspect of Mars can get to me? The gravity of Mars? But it's easy to calculate that uh, the gravity of the obstetrician exceeds the gravity of Mars. Uh, the obstetrician weighs a whole lot less, but the obstetrician is a whole lot closer. Do you think that science and religion are compatible? It depends very much on uh, how you view the arena of religion. If I look at uh, the Bible, I see, uh, especially in the King James translation, great literature, great poetry. I see some powerful ethical and moral uh, prescriptions, including the importance of, of charity. I also see, see some, some dreadful stuff, including uh, mass murder of whole people with God cheering um, one side on. Uh, I see uh, rituals and uh, a sense of community, a lot of things that are really terrific, and I'm absolutely for them, and it's hard to see how how science could be opposed. But the Bible is not a work of science. The science in the Bible was taken by the Jews uh, from the best scientists of 600 B.C. during the Babylonian captivity of the Jews. But we've learned a lot of science since. So uh, uh, mainstream Roman Catholics and Reformed Jews and most of the... Uh, mainstream Protestant denominations have no difficulty at all with uh, uh, evolution of human beings from other animals, an earth that's 4.6 billion years old, the Big Bang, and so on. But on the other hand, if you are a biblical literalist, then you have problems. A biblical literalist is someone who thinks that the Bible was dictated by the creator of the universe to an unerring stenographer with no room for allegory or metaphor. If you believe that, then you have all sorts of problems on the boundaries of, uh, of science and religion. Are you a religious man yourself? I think it's impossible to be a scientist and to confront, even occasionally, the grandeur, subtlety, elegance, and magnificence of the universe without feeling a sense of reverence and awe. But that's very different from concluding that there's a God who uh, um, issues punishments and rewards after you're dead, or that prayer works, uh, or that the Bible is written by anybody but fallible human beings. So that means that you have that you're in awe of the universe, that there's something, what, something larger than uh, any of us, but you wouldn't define it as God. Well, the word God is used to cover so many different points of view. Um, 
I mean, it's a lot to say. Let me just spend a minute. Mm -hmm. First of all, you can be religious without believing in God. Mm -hmm. Buddhists are certainly religious without having any any notion of God. Um, secondly, the word God, it's amazing how diverse the definitions are. Let me give two extremes. One is the sort of God that I, I uh, gathered by uh, osmosis during my childhood, which is an outsized white male who sit with a long white beard who sits on a throne in the sky and tallies the fall of every sparrow. Now, that kind of anthropocentric God, there is, as far as I can tell, no compelling evidence for at all, none. At the other extreme, there is... Uh, um, the kind of God that Einstein and Spinoza talked about, uh, not too different from the sum total of the laws of nature. Now, there are laws of nature, and not only that, they apply everywhere to a quasar 10 billion light years away as, as to uh, the eastern seaboard of the United States. Uh, and it's, it's a very remarkable fact that the same laws do apply so generally. It, could have been a different set of laws applies in every county. So that kind of God, of course, exists. Who would deny that there are laws of nature? So I, I claim you learn absolutely nothing about someone's belief if you ask them, do you believe in God? And they say yes or no. You have to specify which of the countless kinds of God you have in mind. I don't myself like to use the word in that context because it doesn't illuminate at all. If I say I believe in God, or if I say I don't believe in God, and, and I say no more, you've learned nothing about, about what my belief system is. My guest is Carl Sagan. His new book is called The Demon Haunted World, Science as a Candle in the Dark. We'll talk more after a break. This is Fresh Air. Back with scientist and astronomer Carl Sagan. You were very sick recently with a, a rare disease cause, ca called a myodysplasia. And um, I think your doctor told you you would have been dead in six months if you didn't get treatment. And your treatment That's included right. bone marrow transplant and, and real heavy doses of chemotherapy. It was, it was really mm -hmm. killing doses of chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I believe you're, you're out of the woods now. Yes, yes. All the I'm, I'm, I've been incredibly lucky. All the signs are are positive, and I'm feeling great, and my stamina is high. So, uh, you know, you never can be sure, but you never can be sure whether or not you've had <laughs> such diseases. But uh, it looks as if I've I've made it through. Now, did you find yourself relying on any faith in science or faith in? Um, so, something more spiritual or, you know, what, what, we'd, what we'd call religion, <laughs> while, while you were really sick and, and trying what, to get through that? What saved me mm -hmm. uh, is, uh, first of all, the cutting edge of medical science. Mm -hmm. uh, as my wife Annie said, I was riding the crest of medical research in the sense that had I gotten this disease uh, just uh, three or four years early, uh, I would probably be dead. Uh, so it, it uh, certainly underscored for me the personal importance of, uh, of scientific research. And then secondly is the, the loving care of my family, especially, especially Annie, uh, who in, in many ways, both metaphorical and literal, uh, saved my life. So that, that's what I, what I think about in 
in thinking back on my illness. And no, I never had a near-death experience. I was never tempted to, uh, to uh, abandon skepticism and uh, believe something without, without uh, adequate evidence just because I was in emotional need. So where do you turn for answers to those nagging questions like, what is life about? <laughs> what am I well, doing here? I have, <laughs> I have a tolerance for ambiguity. Uh, uh, it's clear to me that there are some questions that humans don't have the answers to. And, and what arrogance to imagine that we have answers to all questions. See, science is sometimes, I know, attacked for supposed arrogance. But I think it's the most humble occupation and discipline around. Because instead of trying to impose our preconceptions, our predispositions on the universe, we are open before the universe to see what the universe has to offer. Uh, science is in the business of finding out what's true, to the extent humans are capable of that. Whereas a lot of these other disciplines are in the business of pretending that what feels good is true. Have you been interested over the years in science fiction novels and films? Well, when I was little, um, starting about, I don't know, 8, 9, 10, science fiction held enormous fascination. I, I couldn't read textbooks, or at least I didn't have access to textbooks that I could read. But there was a lot of science in, uh, in science fiction, and it was rippling with the sense of wonder. But as I got older and could learn some science, I found the science to be uh, uh, more subtle, more complex, more challenging, uh, more full of wonder, and having the additional not inconsiderable virtue of being true. Uh, to whatever extent, uh, as I say, that we're capable of, of understanding the truth. Have you ever watched The X-Files on TV? Regrettably, yes. You don't like it? What it purports to do is to show a, uh, somebody credulous and somebody skeptical as partners investigating claims of the paranormal. What it actually is is two wholly credulous people uh, always discovering that there's something to the paranormal or pseudoscientific claims, always finding that the U.S. <laughs> government is hiding data, and the skeptical point of view never comes out. More true to life would be two skeptics who always find that the thing is a hoax or a misapprehension or a psychological aberration. That's the way the world really works. Carl Sagan, his new book is called The Demon Haunted World, Science as a Candle in the Dark. Fresh Air's senior producer is Danny Miller. Our engineers this week are Richard Parker, Audrey Bentham, and Fred Snyder. Dorothy Farabee is our administrative assistant. Roberta Sherrock directs the show. I'm Terry Gross.